so blessed to be a child of God. Open your Bibles with me, please, to Matthew chapter 9, verse 24. Matthew chapter 9, verse 24. And I want to say again that um, what can I say about Sunday morning other than the fact, wow. And you can spell wow backwards and it says the same thing, wow. Coming in and going, it was a blessing here Sunday. What a tremendous blessing we had. Three saved, a good crowd, uh, just a lot of blessings. And uh, if you don't mind, let's stand for the reading of God's word, verse 24, Matthew chapter nine. If you don't have a Bible with you, it is up here in the lights. Let me know all of God's word is up in the light, amen. It is light. Verse 24, he said unto them, Jesus is speaking, give place for the maid, the little girl, is not dead, but she sleepeth. And they laughed at Jesus. They laughed him to scorn. What an amazing God we have that overcomes death, hell, and the grave. And no matter what we face in life, Jesus is the great resurrection in life. And I simply want to use for a subject tonight, Easter leftovers. You may be seeing Easter leftovers. Now, I'm not talking about leftovers that we had in the meal. I'm talking about the leftovers that Jesus left behind. And my, them are wonderful leftovers that Jesus left behind. He left behind a, a promise. He left behind energy. He left behind encouragement. Because thank God, Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. And we serve a living Savior. He's Christ the Lord. And I want to just mention a few things tonight and just kind of look at some things that will recharge our batteries. And if you were here Sunday morning, your battery's already full, so we're just going to top it off and run it over. Amen. With the energy from the above, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, all of us in this room, if you know anything about the Bible, you understand that Jesus is a wonder, miracle, working God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Notice I did not say Jesus was a miracle worker. He was, but he still is. And in the future, he's going to perform a lot more miracles. And one of those miracles will be a repeat of what happened at his tomb and every tomb across the planet. For Jesus Christ said to Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The question, do you believe this? And I want to shout, I believe it. Now, the story is, is extraordinary. It's amazing. A little girl became deathly sick. In fact, so sick that she actually died physically. Aren't you glad God doesn't call death death? He calls it sleeping. You can always wake something up that's sleeping. And God looks at even death as just a temporary state in, or condition in one's existence. It's just a temporary thing. Now, I'm grateful for the fact that no matter what we face, God has prepared eternity for us. We're gonna be somewhere a trillion years from tonight, we will be somewhere. And I wanna make sure that I'm in heaven with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when God brought me into the world, I didn't exist except in the mind of God. I didn't exist except in the loins of Adam. I didn't exist except in the loins of my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, my father. I just existed in their loins. God knew that I existed, but I didn't. 
My existence began when I was birthed by my mama and my daddy into the Aikens family. And I was born without God and without hope in this world, but thank God I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God quickened my heart and I believed on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and by a supernatural birth, I became not just, I was born through mama and dad and Aikens. I was born to Father God and the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ, a Christian. And I'll, I, I'm ever grateful for the fact that if we mess up, there's another chance. I'm grateful for the fact that God is the God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth and sixth. Lord knows how many chances we need. But God is the God of great chances. He is a loving, wonderful God. Amen? Come on now. I know this is Wednesday, but uh, hey, you know, God's sitting on the throne right now looking us over. <laughs> and the little, the little girl, somewhere around 12 years old, was, became very sick, and she's, she's dying. She's, she's real bad. And her daddy, by the name of Jairus, or Jairus, but they depend on how you pronounce it, he, uh, he has heard of this miracle worker. He's heard of Jesus, how incredible and how um, powerful he is to heal the sick. So he goes looking for Jesus, and he finds him. But David, friends, when something bad happens in your life, you will go looking for Jesus, and you will find him. And when Josh found him, he said, my daughter is at the point of death. Please come and heal my little girl. Well, on his way, there were some detours. He healed the lady with an issue of blood for 12 years, and on his way to heal the daughter, it's slowed down. Have you ever noticed that we really get upset when things slow down. Uh, it slowed down for Jairus, and he was in a panic. And let me tell you, friends, when you're in a panic, you don't want to slow down. You want to move, run as fast as you can. And I, I felt probably Jairus probably wanted to run, probably wanted Jesus to run. But Jesus stopped to heal this lady with an issue of blood 12 years well, when they finally got to the house, a servant runs out to meet Jairus and Jesus, and he says to the daddy of the little girl, it's too late. Why trouble the master? She's dead. And Jesus Christ said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Everything stopped. Time out here. Believe. Did not I tell you believe and it would happen? And Jesus makes his ascent to where the little girl is and he, he makes a statement. The little girl's not dead, she sleeps. And they laughed and made fun of Jesus. And Jesus said, all right, get out. He ran them out of the house. And he only invited those that believed. Peter and John, his disciples, and of course the father and the mommy. And he walks in that bedroom where that little dead body is. Remember, Jesus said she sleeps. And Jesus made one statement in our text. He said, give place to God. Let's, no matter what you're facing in this life, give place to God. And Jesus says, I'm going to give place to God. And he took that little girl by the hand. And he says, little damsel, little, little maid, little girl, arise. What a wake-up call. Jesus takes her by the hand and says, telekumai. That is to say, little damsel, arise. And the little girl sit up straight. And how many know there was a shout and a 
praise and the glory taking place in that room when that little girl came back alive. And I can't wait till the day we see people that have went on before us and that we'll see them again. I can't imagine the thrill and the joy that have flooded my heart when I see loved ones and see friends and relatives that's went on to meet God. I'll see them again. I'll see them again. And what a celebration that will be. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. God says that every human being that lies in the graveyard sleeps. And every human being that's ever went out into the, the, this world uh, in, the, in, the, in the form of death God knows where every molecule is. God knows where every member is. God knows where every memory of that loved one is. You say, well, preacher, what about those that's died at sea and, and uh, the fish of the sea has eaten them and they've, they've been parted in the waters and they've, they've brought and disintegrated. That doesn't matter. God has them all right up here in his mind. God has them all right in his heart. No one's gonna be lost. No one's gonna be left out. Our God knows every molecule out there and he will bring those loved ones back home into the bosom of our heart. That's exciting. I said, that's exciting. And I'm grateful for the fact that God has taken care of the business at hand in our life. In fact, he shed his blood so that you and I could have forgiveness of sin. In fact, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, it talks about taking the lamb and killing it, putting the blood upon the two side posts. And that blood's put on the outside, two side posts, and the, God's going to set Egypt, uh, set the children of, e e uh, children of Israel free from Egypt. And God says, you go inside the house. And in verse 23 of Exodus 12, he says, and when I see the blood, when they applied that blood upon the upper post of the door and the two side posts, when they applied the blood, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Verse 23 says, and the Lord shall pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. How, how many know that's a lot of good, wonderful protection. God hovering over your house to protect you. I, you know, the moment you believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God hovers over your life. The moment you let Jesus become your Lord and your Savior and you put your trust in God's word and you put your trust in God's son, the moment you received the blood that was sacrificed for your sin, Jesus on the cross of Calvary, the moment Jesus steps into your life, God hovers over you to make sure that you are never disintegrated in time, you are never lost in time, you are never lost and destroyed. God hovers over you saying, you're mine and I'll take you home to be with me and you will live in heaven forever because God paid the price for our sin, the blood of the lamb. And God says he'll hover over that door. The blood's there and I want you to know I've got in my house and I've got the blood of Jesus Christ on my life and God hovers over me to make sure the destroyer can't come in and destroy me. God watches over me. And I want you to know that if you'll put your trust in the blood of the lamb, God will watch over you. I want to say, first of all, uh, we need to give place to God. When you're down and discouraged, give place to God. When it looks like your whole life is unwound and, and falling apart, give place to God. When you go to getting older in years and your physical health is starting to vanish and begin to disintegrate, give place to God. When you're a young man or a young woman and you're, you're trying to make ends meet and it seems like it's a struggle of life, give place to God. Every day of your life, give place to God. Every day, every moment, give place place to God, give place to prayer, give place to, to church attendance, give place to worshiping God, give place to reading the Bible, give place to what God has done, give place to God, give place to Jesus Christ, move over and let him in. Step aside and let him stand beside you. Let Jesus come in where you are and allow him and invite him into your life. I never will forget I heard a story about a guy driving down the road 
and he's by himself. He's coming back from a meeting. He's driving home in his automobile. He's a preacher, and he preached, and he's driving home, and the devil gets in the car with him. Oh, he couldn't see him, but he was there. I may have had the devil giving you a hard time. I have. No devil got in the car with him. He said, that wasn't a very good sermon. You did a bad job. God's, God's not happy with you. You do all this work and you travel and nobody appreciates you and you just, you just, you're a failure, you're a flop, you're wasting your time and the old preacher finally just had all he could stand going about 70 mile an hour down the road. He hits the brake, pulls over the right, uh, right away and he jumps out of his car, slams the driver's side, runs around to the passenger side, opened the door and said, devil, I pay the payments on this car. This car belongs to me. The gas that fuels this car, I bought it myself. Now get out, I'm going home without you. Well, I'm not gonna take the devil with me, but I'm gonna take Jesus home. Amen? There's a place in the scripture where Jesus uh, cast the devil out of a, a, a child that was demon possessed. The mother came to him and said, my, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And, and Jesus Christ said, well, go in peace. And when she got home, the Bible says that woman that had that little demon possessed girl, that woman found the devil gone. <laughs> well, I tell you what, how, how would you like to get home tonight and find the devil gone? Amen? Jesus comes in to our life. I'm talking about this resurrection power and I'm gonna share some things with you tonight. I'll not keep you very long, but long enough that we can, we can enjoy some of the reflections of that, that uh, Easter leftovers. I wanna say Jesus died for us as the Lamb of God, but on that cross of Calvary, in Mark chapter 15, verse 22, it says they bring him, they brought Jesus to the place. Everybody say to the place. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which being interpreted the place of the skull. They brought Jesus to the place of Golgotha called the place of the skull. And there at Golgotha, there at Calvary, there at the place of Mount Moriah on Mount Calvary, on the place of the skull, there at Golgotha's hill, the Son of God was crucified on the cross of Calvary because Jesus Christ took our place. See, I'm gonna give place to God because he gave place to me. And the Bible says that Jesus went to the place he went to the place of my despair. He went to the place of my sin and death. He went to the place of my rejection. Jesus Christ went to the place and bled and died upon the cross of Calvary. He went to the place there to die for my sin and your sin. He went there to agonize and to suffer on the cross. He went there to die. I said he went there to die. He went there to shed his blood for you and I. He went there to take the wrath of God upon his life. He went there to pay the ultimate sacrifice. But after he died, and I preached about this Sunday morning, they wrapped him in linen cloth after they took him off the cross of Calvary and they wrapped a hundred pounds of myrrh and, and spices on his body. And they, when they wrapped him up, they put him in the tomb. And the, and the Bible says that the women came the next morning with, uh, on, uh, on a Sunday morning with spices in their hand. But they didn't need the spices because Jesus had already left the graveyard. Jesus had already raised again from the grave. And Jesus has left in our heart spices and blessings and, and the goodness of God. Jesus died at the place of the skull. He shed his blood at the place of Golgotha, which is called uh, the skull. But notice after he died at the place, in Mark 16, verse six, it says, behold the place where they laid him. They took Jesus and put him in the tomb. And while he was there in the tomb, the Bible says that after three days and three nights, Two angels appeared, the stone was rolled away, and those two angels shining bright like the sun, two men the Bible calls them, but they were angels shining as bright as the sun, white, whiter than snow. And they said to the women, 
Why seek ye the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He's not here. Don't you remember what he told you that he would have to suffer for man, but he would rise again from the grave? You go tell the disciples that he's risen and they'll meet him or he'll meet you in Galilee. And I want you to know that he went to that place, that graveyard, that tomb, and there at that tomb, Jesus Christ, Settle death once and forever. God has made a place for us. And it's not a graveyard. I said, God has made a place for us and it's not a place of torture and torment. The Bible says in John 14, verse one, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place for you. Now, I I read that scripture. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, I want you to know that Jesus don't get our hopes up to crush us and, and disappoint us. And I've always wondered why Jesus Christ said, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'll go to prepare a place for you. And I always wondered what he meant by saying, if it were not so, I would have told you. I always wondered why that's there. Why did he even say that? And I think he was actually saying, I'm settling the question about how the Father is. I've showed you that the Father is a God of love. I've showed you that the Father cares for you. Basically what Jesus was saying was the Father isn't a tyrant in heaven that doesn't care. The Father is not a God in heaven that doesn't, in my Father's house are many mansions, and he's not holding them to, to, to his own self, but he gave his son Jesus Christ so that you and I could be given a place. I'm glad that I have a place to go. I'm mean, glad you got a place to go. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. He prepared a, a place of forgiveness on the cross of Calvary. He prepared a place of hope in this troubled world. He prepared a place for you and I. And not only did he prepare a place, but he left a return address. I said, Jesus left a return address. He said, I'll go, and if I go, I shall come again and receive you unto myself. You know, I always wondered where Jesus Christ is coming when he comes back. He's not coming just to the atmosphere, as Thessalonians says. He will do that. He'd come into the clouds. Yes, he'll do that. But Jesus Christ is coming right in here. He's going to find the spot that believed on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter what you've done in life, Jesus is coming back for you. He's not coming back for a synagogue. He's not coming back for a tabernacle. He's, uh, he's coming back for a tabernacle, but we are the tabernacle. He's not coming back for a certain place. He's coming back for the earth to redeem it. Yes, he's coming back for Israel as a nation. Yes, but he's coming back for that one person, you and I, individually. He's coming back for you and for me. And Jesus left a return address. He said, I'm coming back for you. No matter where you are, no matter where you go, let me say that again. No matter where you are or no matter where you go, Jesus will find you and he will keep you. He'll bless you. Isn't that beautiful? No matter where we are, where we go, God has promised to take care of us if we'll put our trust in the redemption of Jesus Christ. Let me read a scripture to you, and I've read this many times, but I think it's incredible. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29, my sheep hear my voice, Jesus Christ said, and I know them and they know me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I want you to know no matter where you are or where you go, Jesus Christ says, I 
will keep you. I will make sure that you will never perish. Isn't that beautiful? You say, well, preacher, I don't know where my loved ones just died. I don't know where they're at. My daddy went to be with the Lord. My mom is gone. My, I've got several relatives that are gone, uh, and their body sleeps in the graveyard. Uh, and you say, well, what if they're not in the graveyard? I've had several relatives that were cremated. Uh, I want you to know that every person rests in the bosom of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you rest in the bosom of Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for the fact that I know where they're sleeping, but I don't know where they're awakened. They're with Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, that's where they are. And the Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. Are you getting it? Are you listening to me? And so... Jesus Christ said, I will not let them perish. He left the graveyard open for options. I said that Sunday morning. Let me show you an interesting scripture. John 20, verse 6 and 7. Then cometh Simon Peter following him. Now he's following John. They're running to the tomb. They've heard that Jesus has risen from the grave. And John runs and Peter runs and John outruns Peter, and then when Peter gets there, the Bible says, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lain with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. I want to say this, Jesus left the napkin in a place by itself. Now, there's a lot there, and I want you to listen to me. I've heard it preached on the napkin many ways, many different thoughts about the napkins. But the napkin was wrapped about his head. And there's a lot of interpretations about why the clothes were neatly left in its place and the napkin was folded and laid at a certain place. There was not chaos in the tomb. There was not confusion in the tomb. And God don't want you to be confused either. When Jesus got up, he got up and left his grave clothes behind. And he took the napkin that was about his head and he rolled it off and he folded it and laid it in a certain place. It didn't look like a bomb had went off in the tomb. It looked like a sovereign God got up, folded his clothes and walked out. What about the napkin left in a certain place? Well, if you go to a big meal and they'll put, lay the silverware out and you'll have a big meal and there'll be a napkin. And that napkin is there to take care of spills or to wipe your mouth after eating something. And um, I went out to steak dinner just a few days ago and uh, I had a napkin. The silverware was rolled up in the napkin and uh, I've watched some guys take the napkin and stuff them down in their shirt and it's all hanging down. I even watched a guy walk into Golden Corral with a butcher's apron on. I mean, he was serious about eating. And uh, I'm not kidding you. He'd go to Western City, go to Golden Corral, and he'd have a butcher's apron on. And I went and asked him one time, why are you wearing that butchering apron? He said, just watch me for a few minutes and you'll see why. And I did, and then, and then I knew why. But anyway... Jesus gets up. Now, if you go to a meal and you eat a good meal and you take that napkin, when you're done, you never fold it up. You just throw it in the plate, throw it beside the table, and you're done eating. But if I'm at your house and I've got to go to the restroom or something, I'm not going to take the napkin and throw it in the plate. I'm going to fold that napkin up and lay it in a certain place because I don't want you to take my plate away. See, when you're done eating, you throw the napkin in the plate and you're done. But when you fold it up and lay it in a certain place, it's to tell everybody, I'll be back. I'm not done. Are you getting it? When Jesus got up from the tomb, he folded the napkin, he laid it in the side as if to say, 
I'm not through with this. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. No, he's not coming back to be spit upon. He's not coming back to be ridiculed. He's not coming back to be crucified. He's not coming back to be beaten. He's not coming back to be scorned and rejected. He's coming back in the clouds of glory to bring the clouds of glory, to bring those that sleep in Jesus with him. He comes to the tomb to once and forever destroy the victory of the grave. He comes to destroy the power of death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when Jesus Christ folded the napkin and laid it to the side, he was saying, I'll be back but I'm not coming back to die. I'm not coming back to, to, to be tortured or spit upon or crucified. I'll be back, but I'm gonna be back for everybody that's in this graveyard. I'm gonna be back for everybody that's been in a tomb or in a grave. I'll be back, I'll be back, I'll be back. And I want you to know, he's coming back. Yeah. Amen. We need to remember that, don't you? First Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We're Christians, we don't sorrow. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Are you listening to me? I'll wrap it up with this thought. We need to remember his words. Give place to God. We need to remember his words, the words of Jesus. Luke 24, verse five through eight says, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, that's where the two angels were at the tomb and the tomb was empty. They said unto them, why seek ye? The angel said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. We all just need to remember his words. Boy, do we need to remember his words in the unstable life we're in, the unstable world, North Korea, all these different places that you never know what's gonna happen, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, of course, North Korea, and it may surprise you, the greatest enemy may be within our own country, we don't know. But we know this, no matter what happens, God is still God. And no matter what happens in our life, we need to remember his words. He said, I will come again. Jesus Christ said, I will come again. Remember his words, and they shall never perish. Look up here, look up here, look up here. This guy right here talking to you, I shall never perish. I'm not bragging about myself. I'm bragging about my Savior, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now I want you to point at yourself and say, you shall never perish. Just point at yourself, I shall never perish because of Jesus. And I, do, I just want you to understand that you're gonna have, we're all gonna have some gloomy days. We're all gonna have some tough moments. We're all gonna have some washing out. We're all, we're all gonna have some really terrible, terrible ordeals in our life. We're gonna see loved ones go on before us. We're gonna see the storms and the trials come our way. Have you ever got up one morning and said, oh man, I feel so black. Anybody? Come on, anybody? Anybody in this room ever woke up and said, man, I feel so bleh. 
And then the person that calls you don't help, they don't help a bit. Amen? Somebody will walk up to you and say, oh man, you look awful today. He's already feeling awful. Now they're about to put you in the grave. You look awful. Did you know you can talk people into just outright devastation? Now, before I was saved, this, this didn't happen while I was a Christian, but before I was saved, I always heard the story you could talk someone into being sick. And I used to work at Fort Garage, and we had a guy that he was always having a headache. He, he always had whatever. If, if you had it, he had it 10 times worse. You ever met guys like that? And he came in one morning, he was whistling, he was so happy. This is a gorgeous day, and it was a beautiful day. But me and my friends got together and decided we are going to try that out. We are going to see if we could talk him sick. Now, I shouldn't have done it, but my buddies tempted me, and I did eat and partake. But anyway, he came in, and he was happy. He was, he was happy. I said, oh, man. I said, you look horrible today. I said, are you all right? You look like you've got a fever. You look like, man, you, you maybe ought to be home. You're bad, bad, look bad. And my friends got around every time they saw him and said, oh, man, you're looking bad. My friends, about, about four or five of them get around and say, man, I don't know whether you're going to make it through today. You look so bad. You, so, you all right? Are you sure? He said, yeah. He started out saying, yeah, I feel great. And toward the days long and on toward noon, he said, oh, no, man, I am going to be. And did you know before, before it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he had done checked out, clocked out, went home because he was deathly sick. <laughs> we talked him into it. He come back the next morning and said, I feel great. I feel wonderful. And I said, you look horrible. This is the second day. He said, I'm not falling for that again. You guys just said I was bad. And he said, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said there wasn't nothing wrong with me but a bunch of friends saying that I look bad. I said, where did you get your excuse for missing work? He said, you're going to go into the office and give them the excuse. <laughs> Amen. Now, don't look at me like that. Beverly's shaking her head like, man, this is an evil pastor. I wasn't even saved yet. Amen. We're, we're leaders, aren't we? We're leaders. And we need to tell people how wonderful it is to be a Christian. We need to excite people and bless people. Amen. I went into a place one time and I always heard that if you look up, the rest of the people look up. And I went into the place and I started looking up. I just kept looking up. Directly people would walk around, they'd look up. I'm just looking up. There's nothing up there, but I'm looking. And people gathering around, I'm starting to get a crowd and they're all looking. A little child went, look! And I said, where, where? There wasn't nothing up there. But you know, you can do the same thing by doing this. It's exciting, the tomb is empty. It's exciting, Jesus has promised us eternal life. It's exciting, we're going somewhere. We might be there before sunrise. The Lord's coming. I woke up the other morning, heard the awfulest racket, awfulest racket. I thought, man, the Lord's coming. My Lord, the Lord's coming. It was a horrible racket. Things don't wake me up. I'm, I sleep sound. And, and it was a horrible racket. I said, oh, man, the Lord's coming. And I jumped up out of bed. And my wife had a skill saw running in the garage. And there's nothing worse than a skill saw early in the morning when it's hitting through naughty wood. Isn't that right, Vince? It's loud. Say, so what'd you do, preacher? I went and seen her. 
Did you scold her? I went and seen her. I said, preacher, did you, did, you, did you tell her not to do it when you were trying to sleep? I said, I went and seen her. I went to her and I said, honey, be careful with that saw. I'd hate for you to get hurt. I love you, babe. I kissed her. I said, what'd you do? Went back to bed. Did you go back to sleep? No, because she kept sawing. <laughs> anyway, I want you to understand that we all have our hard moments. We all have our trials. Find some good in it. Find some good in it. Raymond, I enjoyed seeing him when he was here. The Lord was doing something in his life. You know what? There's a whole lot of people in Salem showed their love to him. And a whole lot of people heard some things that they needed to hear. That don't make it any easier for you. But it is incredible that God can bring good out of horrific situations. We got an awesome God. We got to remember him, remember his words. Remember what he has to say. Trust him, trust him. He is a magnificent God. Stand with me. Josh going to come and bring us on. God is a magnificent God. I remind you that he went to the tomb. They laid him in a place where so many before us have been laid in a place. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ broke that place, conquered that place, so that you and I could have a place with him in heaven. I want you to understand that we all in this room need to give place to God. Do it tonight. Do it tomorrow. Do it in, in the storm. Do it in the sunshine. Just give place to God. Give God place. Because Jesus gave God place and he gave you place, gave me and you place in our life. So it's important that we give our, our place to him. All is open as Josh sings and Terry plays. Maybe you'd like to come to this altar and say, I just want to give place to God. I just want to give place to God. You do that as they play and sing.